today it is our huge delight to be speaking with Dr. Jeffrey Trelore. Dr. Trelor is Director of Learning and Teaching at the Australian College of Theology in Sydney, Australia. Dr. Trelore, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Hmm. Dr. Trelore is also author of the text that we'll be discussing today, The Disruption of Evangelicalism, The Age of Tory, Mott, McPherson, and Hammond. And if I can jump straight into our first question, Dr. Trelore, this is the fourth book of a five-volume beautiful set on the history of evangelicalism. If I can simply enumerate the titles briefly for our viewers, first title is by Mark Knoll, and it's called The Rise of Evangelicalism, The Age of Edwards, Whitfield, and the Wesleys. Second volume is titled The Expansion of Evangelicalism, The Age of Wilberforce, Moore, Chalmers, and Finney. Thirdly, and immediately preceding our volume, The Dominance of Evangelicalism, The Age of Spurgeon and Moody, and then following your volume by Brian Stanley, The Global Diffusion of Evangelicalism. Dr. Trelor, your volume, The Disruption of Evangelicalism, covers essentially the years from 1900 to 1940. What is it that causes this disruption of evangelicalism, please? Perhaps I should begin, uh, Jonathan, by just saying what I, what I mean by disruption. Um, I, I think we began well by rehearsing the titles of the other volumes in the series. Um, when you put them as, alongside one another, what you notice is that um, each individually uh, is, is, is a positive and that together they kind of imply a progress. Um, um, a record of success over almost 300 years now. When I looked at the early 20th century, uh, what I saw was quite different. Um, I saw uh, a time of, of declension, um, a time of um, uh, setback, um, consternation, the need to adjust and uh, a certain bewilderment. Um, what I said in the book is that the period roughly 1890 to 1910 is something of a golden age in the history of evangelicalism, but after that, things fall away pretty dramatically. So this, this uh, process of uh, rise, expansion, dominance, and going on to global diffusion um, seems to have been interrupted during the early 20th century years. So that was, that was one thing. I, I looked around for a word which would Kind of encapsulate that kind of experience, a period of setback. But there's there's a bit more to this word disruption than uh, most people uh, understand. It's it's a technical term um, used in the social sciences um, to kind of describe how people respond to disasters. It comes out of disaster research. Um, disruption occurs when the way people have understood the world and its operations uh, is, is challenged, changes. So their, their, their plausibility structures, their ontological presumptions, they come into question. They no longer seem to be uh, adequate for understanding the world in which uh, people are living. So my submission is that's what early 20th century evangelicals experienced. So that's, that's a little more technical. Uh, and, and important. And, and what's also worth noticing in the social sciences is that whilst we see the word disruption uh, mainly in negative terms, it can have a, a positive connotation as well, because disruption is often the beginning of renewal, regeneration. You know, out of destruction comes new life. And I think uh, that sense uh, has a certain resonance with the history of the evangelical movement in the early 20th century as well. So why did disruption understood in these ways take place? Well, the, the first uh, reason um, that I brought forward are the impact of extraordinary events. The early 20th century was the era, as, as we all know, of two world wars and the Great Depression. These uh, global events of unprecedented magnitude and impact, uh, everybody was affected. So we, we oughtn't to be surprised by the impact on, on evangelicals. They know more than anybody else really knew how to, to cope. 
with the events by which they were confronted in their day. The second thing is what I've called the, the loss of cultural authority. Um, around about 1900, uh, evangelicals were still people who, who mattered in society. Their voice was listened to, their views were heeded. They, they did have influence. Now, um, it, it had declined. That sort of cultural authority had declined from what it had been, say, around about 1850, but it was still, still significant. By 1940, uh, evangelicals no longer command the same presence in society. They're no longer quite so influential. So something very important has been lost. They go from being culturally significant to being culturally marginal. And for, for many evangelicals, that, that was a new experience and they, they weren't quite sure how, how to deal with it. Yeah, people weren't taking any notice of them anymore or not taking the same notice. So that was a big shock. Then, then the third thing uh, is the pluralization of evangelicalism itself. Um, evangelicalism in 1940 was a much more varied movement from what it had been uh, in 1900. So th there were internal developments which um, evangelicals found puzzling and didn't quite know how to understand or manage, uh, how to cope with the, the changes that were taking place within the, um, that part of society, which they would have called home. So um, three big changes, three big forces at work to bring about this disruption. Underneath it all uh, are the processes of modernization, you know, the rise of the mass society, uh, urbanization, industrialization, internationalization, commercialization, all those big forces which were at work to make the modern world what it is. Excellent, Dr. Trelore, Modernism was surely one of the factors that disrupted evangelicalism in the first half of the 20th century. How do you define modernism, please? Yeah, um, you're certainly right to you know, identify modernism as one of the major elements of this uh, disruptive experience. Um, the modernist approach to Christianity was really quite different from what evangelicals would have taken for, for granted uh, as um, constituting the, the Christian experience. Um, and, and what that means, I think, becomes clear as we talk a little bit more about uh, modernism. A simple definition um, that I like is uh, simply a, a movement to present religion in terms of the mind and spirit of the modern age. Now, a lot more to be said, but that's, that's a, a good one-line definition, I think. Dr. Trelore, thank you for that definition. Were there any uh, theologians or historians of that era who gave enduring definitions of modernism? Are you following somebody from that era as you construct that vision of modernism, please? There's a massive literature generated by the modernist movement, but the source, my go-to source, is an essay uh, which was published in the journal, The Modern Churchman in 1922. It's called The Spirit of Modernism. And it's written by the editor of the journal, a fellow by the name of Major, H-D-A Major. He's actually a New Zealander, but he spent most of his working life in England as principal of Ripon Hall, which, um, uh, moved to Oxford in the course of his tenure of that office. Now, in these nine pages, Major sums up pretty well what modernism was all about. And um, I, if you like, I just give you uh, a taste of what he said. There's, yeah. there's no sort of drop dead sentence in this essay. I had a look for it. I thought it might help us today. But um, I think what, what I read on page 116, I think helps us to uh, get to the heart of what modernism is all about. Major writes, we have noted already that modernism is not a system, but an orientation. This orientation is the product of certain convictions. Of these, perhaps the most important is that the static conception of the universe is false. Rapidly accumulating evidence, scientific and historical, 
indicates that we are in the midst of a vast process of which we are both products and factors. As a Christian, the modernist believes that this process is essentially rational, moral, and spiritual. He has faith that in the end, notwithstanding many present appearances to the contrary, this fundamentally Christian conviction will be able to justify itself to every rational, moral, and spiritual creature. Further, he believes that the evolutionary process is essentially creative. It is bringing new realities into existence as it advances. But it must be insisted that to be an evolutionist is not to be tied down to a mechanical view of the universe. The modernist does not regard the universe as a machine which either imprisons or excludes God for closely bound up with his acceptance of, the, of evolution is his belief in the progressive unveiling of the divine nature and will by the operation of the spirit of God in human personality. And I'll just skip over a little bit and just finish off this paragraph. And he talks about the words of the fourth gospel. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot hear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth is come, he shall guide you into all truth. These words are to the modernist prophetic of this progressive revelation of the spirit. And he is convinced that it is to this progressive revelation rather than to the actual words of scripture or to the formulations of ecclesiastical tradition that the church should be loyal. And I think that one paragraph strikes off many of the distinctive characteristics of modernism. So I, I commend that, uh, that brief essay to anyone who was interested in the subject. That's marvelous. And as a church history teacher, those types of recommendations are especially valuable because they often turn into uh, assigned reading for a, uh, a post-Reformation church history class. So I'm especially grateful for that. By this understanding of modernism, is modernism something that's continued into the late 20th and early 21st century? Or are the philosophies that we encounter today really something of a different story? Has, has modernism ended? Well, I think modernism is still with us uh, in lots of forms. Uh, yeah, th there's no longer an identifiable modernist movement within the church, so that in formal ecclesiastical settings, modernism has had its day. But I, I think, um, yeah, we see expressions of the modernist spirit um, all around us, wherever human intuition and will in religion uh, is exalted as the, the ultimate uh, authority. Um, yeah, even atheism and agnosticism are modernist in that sense, but we know there are all sorts of spiritualities around which really amount to little more than a form of humanism, um, Christian or otherwise. So I see modernism as, as ultimately a, a Christian humanism in which human capacity is hegemonic. Everything is decided by uh, what the mind can understand and decide. So it's essentially uh, human-centered mm -hmm. rather than God-focused. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the point at which uh, traditional Christians and modernists would, would part. Um, modernists reject the idea of divine transcendence, mm -hmm. whereas traditional Christians insist upon it. Dr. Trelore, your, your text, The Disruption of Evangelicalism, The Age of Tory, Mott, McPherson, and Hammond, is structured around four leading characters. You give us their names there. R.A. Tory, from 1856 to 1928. John Mott, the, uh, the famous ecumenist, 1865 to 1955. Amy Simple McPherson, 1890 to 1944, the uh, Pentecostal evangelist. And also Thomas Chatterton Hammond, 1877 to 1961. Uh, principle of Moore College. How did you come to select these four central figures um, as the pillars of your narrative, please? It, it's important to understand that, that part of the brief was to um, devise a subtitle using the names of those people who were felt to kind of um, strike off the distinctive note or notes of the period. Um, the, the key people, the people who make evangelicalism in that era, what it was, what it amounted to. Now, this was fairly easy, I think, for volumes one, three, and five. Uh, in, in the early days, uh, Jonathan Edwards, the Wesleys, uh, clearly the leaders of the movement, 
uh, in David Bevington's period, uh, obviously um, uh, his two figures, Moody and also Surgeon, and then obviously um, Billy Graham and John Stott for the latter 20th century. These, these choices were, were pretty straightforward. I think for volume two, uh, a little, little tougher for John Wolfe, but he went with Wilberforce, uh, Hannah Moore, Charles Finney and Thomas Chalmers. Uh, all significant people in that uh, era, but perhaps not having quite the, uh, or stamp, leaving their stamp on the movement to the extent of, say, the Wesleys and the Edwardses. Now, what we're really looking for here are the household names of the evangelical community. And what I, what I found for the early 20th century is that there, there really weren't any. I don't think there was any outstanding figure of the same calibre say, as Spurgeon uh, or Moody. N neither of them came to Australia, let me um, inform you. But their lives, their works, their influence was, was well known. You know, people write academic theses about the influence of these men in Australia in the 19th century, even though they, they never actually came here. Um, I felt that what I needed, obviously, were people of, of stature, people of um, influence, people who had something to say and who uh, did things which are, are worth uh, remembering. But I also wanted evangelicals who were um, genuinely international figures. That, that meant that they really needed to operate beyond their own national borders. And that, that's uh, the criterion that ruled out one or two other contenders. And I also wanted uh, to illustrate different styles of evangelicalism since the pluralization of the movement is one of the, the big developments of the era. So I went for Mott. Uh, he, was a he, he was the easiest choice because he's, he's the outstanding evangelical of the era. Uh, you refer to his contribution to the ecumenical movement, uh, extremely important. Uh, that was a natural expression of his commitment to evangelicalism. That was where, over the course of a long life, um, that's the direction in which he, he naturally headed. But not as interesting as what I call um, a pietistic revivalist and a modernising evangelical. Then there was Torrey, uh, in whom you will be perhaps particularly interested because of his connection with the Moody Bible Institute. Uh, he came to Australia in 1902 when he was, uh, was his title superintendent? Um, anyway, he was, yep. he was essentially the principal. Now, now Torrey is a different kind of evangelical. Um, he's a, what I call um, a rational um, doctrinalist. He's anti-modern. And of course, he went on to become uh, one of the leaders of fundamentalist, the fundamentalist movement in its early days. Amy McPherson. Um, She's really the first significant Pentecostal, I think, uh, with an international reputation. You know, she traveled fairly widely and she's just an incredibly interesting woman, um, different, innovative. Um, she's kind of fits the pietistic revivalist approach as well. So she is like Mott. And then finally, T.C. Hammond. Um, I, I could have gone for another American but I thought it would be misleading to have four Americans uh, as, as the people who are named as giving this, this era its distinctive character. So I needed somebody who um, brings out uh, the, the international dimension of the movement a little more clearly. Hammond uh, made, made his name really here in Australia as the principal of Moore College, but he was an Irishman. Uh, grew up in Cork, caught up in the, um, the sectarian disputes of late 19th century. Uh, Cork went on to become the leader of the Irish Church Missions, an evangelistic body seeking to the conversion of Roman Catholic people. Um, so he, he represents that dimension of the evangelical movement in a, in a very definite kind of way. Um, he uh, got himself involved in the uh, early days of the InterVarsity Fellowship, so he connected with English evangelicals through the IVF. He travelled the British Empire in the 1920s defending the Anglican or Episcopalian Book of Common Prayer, so a genuinely international figure. Most of his life um, 
a member of a minority group in Dublin, um, despised, marginalised, came to Sydney and his position was turned upside down. Um, he suddenly found himself uh, a member of the largest denomination in town, the most influential church group in the city. So he came into a time of influence which in the earlier parts of his life, he could have only have dreamed about. Along the way, he'd written a number of books, particularly in Understanding Be Men, which went on to become influential textbooks in the, uh, the student Christian movement. I don't mean the SCM, I mean amongst, you know, for ministry amongst students. So he seemed to, to fit the bill, and um, it just so happened that I'd already written on Hammond, I'd been through his private papers, so it was a, a, a good choice for, for me to make. Sort of brings in the British imperial connection, if you like. Um, evangelicalism, as this series makes very clear, is a global movement, but its centre is in the English-speaking world. Uh, but the fact that three out of the four are Americans tells its own tale as well. Um, this, is really, this really uh, symbolises the rise of uh, the American influence on the evangelical movement is a kind of changing of the guard, if you will, in the early 20th century, from being essentially a British movement to becoming increasingly an American movement in its, uh, in its content and its spirit. So we have um, two pietistic revivalists and two doctrinalists as representative of the period, but within that, uh, that grouping, there's uh, yeah, quite a range, quite a, a variety of perspective and method. Thank you, Dr. Trelore, for those comments. Dr. Trelore, uh, 1900 is the opening bookend of your book, and 1940 is the closing bookend. And you've already alluded to some of the massive political events that are taking place at that time, World War I, the Depression, and World War II. How, how is ev the evangelicalism that begins that era different from the evangelicalism that closes that era? Hmm. This is one of the key questions, isn't it? And uh, uh, I've already indicated that I, I see this as a, as a time of declension, time of decline from, from a golden age to a period, or to a point in which uh, evangelicals are much weaker uh, and in which they struggle. So uh, what does this sort of declension look like in, in detail? Well, I think one way to go about this is to work with our basic understanding of what evangelicalism is or how it works. Um, the historian William Reginald Ward, uh, in his book on the um, Evangelical Awakening, um, 1992, the Protestant Evangelical Awakening, you know, identifies two basic strands within the evangelical movement, and I've already touched on this. He he notes the existence alongside of one another of those whom he calls experiential revivalists and those whom he calls rational doctrinalists. Um, what we see happening in the early 20th century is experiential revivalism, which is the, the dominant strand around about 1900, being eclipsed by the rational doctrinalists. So it's a, it's a big generalisation, but that's one way of uh, characterising the change. People will perhaps be more familiar with the Bevington quadrilateral, the, the four enduring qualities, which, if they don't define evangelicalism, certainly describe uh, how it works and its operations. Um, uh, George Rawlick uh, refined the Bevington quadrilateral by arguing that what really determines the, the nature of evangelicalism at any one point in time is how these four uh, distinctive characteristics interact with one another. Then the English sociologist Rob Warner took the argument a stage further by identifying two axes. Uh, he thinks that certainly for the period he was studying, which was the 1960s, biblicism and crucicentrism go together to form one axis and conversionism and activism go together to form another. So one way uh, or another way in which we can characterize the change from 1900 to 1940 is that the conversionist activist axis was eclipsed by the biblicist crucicentric axis. Now, it seems to me that's just 
another way of saying the same thing as um, my first point. The, um, uh, the rational doctrinalists got the upper hand over the experiential revivalists. So they're the, they're the, the two kind of broad ways of describing the change. Now, they work, they work out in all sorts of particular ways. There's a, a difference of mood in 1900 from what uh, prevailed in 1940. At the opening of the 20th century, evangelicals were confident, optimistic. Um, they, they thought that uh, yeah, their mission to evangelize the world was, was achievable, uh, and they organized accordingly. By 1940, they're pessimistic, they're uncertain, they're not clear about the place, their place in the world, they're not even clear about the meaning of the gospel. Um, another uh, change uh, relates to their standing in the world. This is the, the cultural authority dimension that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in 1900, evangelicals are relatively successful in society. They have cultural authority. By 1940, they are much weaker. Their cultural authority is seriously diminished. Closely related is their attitude towards the world. In 1900, evangelicals feel pretty much at home in the world. And uh, this is an expression of an underlying post-millennial perspective. By 1940, uh, they're much more eschatologically focused, and this reflects the rise of, of premillennialism on the rise throughout the 19th century. But in the, during the interwar years, it becomes um, much more influential and, 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 and possibly the uh, sort of the underlying force in the determination of evangelical identity. Um, conversionism and social activism, uh, which was strong in 1900, much weaker by 1940. The intellectual output of evangelicals was uh, seriously reduced in, in quality and range uh, by 1940. Uh, um, evangelicals in 1940 were much less inclined to initiate and to support joint ventures. And then uh, lastly, perhaps uh, we should note the advent of Pentecostalism. Um, its modern beginnings are usually dated to 1901, um, first day of the 20th century. Uh, but for most of the period, Pentecostals are you know, relatively small in numbers and weak in influence. But by 1940, they're significant enough to um, warrant the attention of those who are beginning to form the National Association of Evangelicals. You know, they're, you know, the, the, the fathers of the, the NAE are prepared to reach out to Pentecostals. So they have become significant to, to that extent. We should note some continuities as well. Um, Keswick piety was, if anything, stronger in 1940 than it had been in 1900. And uh, anti-Catholicism, which has always been a mark of the evangelical movement until recently, just as strong in 1940 as it had been in 1900, perhaps even marginally stronger after the celebration of the centenary of the Oxford movement in the early 1930s. So that they would be the, the leading changes, I would say. Dr. Trelor, thank you so much for those extremely insightful comments. D.L. Moody, who dies in 1899, the year preceding your era, was able to maintain good relationships with a wide variety of evangelical leaders, including proponents of the social gospel and uh, Henry Drummond, who taught theistic evolution. What happened in the middle of the 20th century that made these kind of broad relationships across the movement untenable? I would say untenable is perhaps slightly overstating it, but, but much, much more difficult to uh, establish and to, and to manage. Well, you know, ecumenism with a small e and cooperation has always been one of the hallmarks of the evangelical movement. And um, they're especially noticeable in the pre-war era. You know, the Edinburgh Missionary Conference of 1910 is the high point of evangelical ecumenism, I would argue. Uh, that sort of arrangement becomes much harder to sustain during the interwar ye years. And um, the obvious explanation for the change is the impact of World War I. Um, I. I would see four things happening more or less at the same time and converging um, on one another. Firstly is the breakdown 
of the broad consensus of what it meant to be an evangelical. You know, the whole concept becomes much more contested. Um, the, the number of ways of understanding what evangelicalism really represents uh, increases during this time and um, pluralization obviously widens scope for, for argument. Pluralization gives rise to a certain loss of trust, confidence in one another. Can't be quite sure any longer who you're dealing with or what you're dealing with. So um, the ability of evangelicals to put aside, uh, acknowledge differences uh, for the purpose of working towards shared ends becomes much more difficult. Um, now, now these are, are factors which sort of come from within the movement itself. Uh, we put them together with the impact of the um, external forces, which were really quite overwhelming in their impact. Um, the war gives rise to a certain combative spirit. Um, the war identifies conflict as a means of achieving objectives and coupled with um, persistence and concentration of resources, you know, fighting is uh, a strategy that's likely to lead to success. So war, the war endorses combat. And then finally, I would uh, identify the, the high stakes of the period. Um, I, I did read quite a lot of um, Christian periodicals from the um, first half of 1919 uh, in, in order to try and identify what the evangelicals of this period were, th were thinking as one era came to an end and a new era began. And they, like most Christians of the, of the time, were very conscious that yeah, this was a new beginning, yeah, like a second chance, a time to start again. And it was really important to get it right. But there were so many competing visions of what would be right for the modern world um, that um, a, a, a fairly vigorous debate developed and it became increasingly aggressive and hostile, and that's what leads to the conflicts of the 1920s and 1930s. So there's a different mood, a different spirit abroad in the evangelical movement in the early 1920s from what had prevailed before the war. That's what I, um, I would say in answer to uh, the question, how is it no longer possible for a moody-like figure to bring mm -hmm. the movement uh, together? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you really have to wait for Billy Graham, don't you, before that kind of, you know, cooperative thinking becomes possible again. Yes, and, and that actually anticipates exactly what my next question was to be, and that is, is there anything in your story that allows us to anticipate the coming of Billy Graham? After, the, after 1940, we have a, a strong separatist stream in the wake of this fundamentalist modernist controversy, and then ultimately we'll get to the ministry of Billy Graham prominently beginning in 1949 with his Los Angeles crusade that set him on a national stage. But are there any clues in the story that you tell that would make us anticipate this, this Billy Graham-like reconciler? Yes. I should say, uh, Jonathan, that I'm so old that I actually heard Billy Graham in his 1968 crusade here in Australia. Um, wow. Where was that held? Was that in Sydney? Yeah, this is, yeah he, he, he moved around the country, but in 1968, I heard him in Sydney. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Trelor, I, I've only heard Billy Graham once in person, and it happened to be the very last night of his Flushing Meadows crusade in 2005, which was his last crusade. So I, yes. I treasure uh, that uh, uh, shared memory with you, if you will. Yes, a, a truly memorable moment. Um, so I, I take it that what your question really has in view is the, the ministry of Billy Graham as an international evangelist of unequaled range and impact. And, and if, that's, if that's what your question envisages, then you know, this book actually has quite a bit to, to say uh, about uh, Billy Graham's antecedents. Um, the, the event with which I begin the book um, is the 1902 uh, revivalist campaign led by Reuben Torrey in Melbourne. Um, you know, I had to start somewhere and serendipitously, I just, uh, because I had access, easy access to sources, I thought I'll just start with the, the Torrey Alexander campaign. Um, 
1902. But this, this must have been providential because uh, Torrey and Alexander in Melbourne in 1902 was the beginning of something big. Um, as, as you probably know, uh, word got out that revival was on in Australia and Torrey and Alexander were swamped with invitations to you know, come over and help us. So um, uh, the campaign grew into what was essentially the first uh, global mission. They are the first evangelists in the history of Christianity to go around the world in a, in a single campaign between 1902 and 1905. So uh, international revivalism had been part of uh, the evangelical movement from the outset. You know, Whit Whitfield and Wesley were international revivalists, but it really gets going in the 1830s in America and becomes a real hallmark of the movement. Uh, Moody is generally regarded as the um, the climax of that development. And of course, Torrey was uh, Moody's understudy for a number of years. So there is a, a line of transmission from Moody right through to Torrey. But Torrey really establishes international revivalism as a feature of early 20th century uh, evangelicalism. So, and to that extent is a, a forerunner of, of Billy Graham. Then um, uh, Mott. Uh, Mott is an even more accomplished traveller than, than Torrey. Um, his uh, movements around the world are much more extensive, but the focus is on young people creating or mobilising students, uh, capturing their potential for the gospel, channelling them into the missionary movement. Well, work with young people was also characteristic of Billy Graham's uh, ministry, particularly in the early years. So now you can see Mott as a forerunner of, of Graham. And then um, Torrey and Mott are representative of, of something much more significant um, in that, like so many others, they, they are kind of moral and spiritual entrepreneurs who take this dimension of American culture around the globe. So this is is an aspect of the rise of America's informal world empire, which developed in the, what should we say, the generation before World War I. So they are direct representatives of evangelical Christianity, but they're also agents of American culture um, in, in the same way that, that Billy Graham was to become. So again, we have significant uh, anticipations of Billy Graham. Now, international revivalism kind of fell by the wayside in the 1920s um, for, for lots of reasons, not the least of which is that most of the revivalists from before the war um, died. You know, their, their time was over. Um, but in the 1930s, international revivalism revives, um, but, but not, not from an American uh, base. Um, the two figures who I identify as significant are Lionel Fletcher, the so-called Empire Evangelist, and J. Edwin Orr, who, who finished up in America, of course, but uh, he's a northern, he's from Belfast, so he's a northern Irishman. And uh, both, both Fletcher and Orr, whilst not being American, they're inspired by the ideals of the international revivalism developed by you know, the likes of Mott and Torrey. So there is a, a strong element of continuity. So we can point to uh, people and events which anticipate Billy Graham. But I think what's also worth noting is the advent of radio and the use of radio as an evangelistic tool. And the great exponent, the greatest exponent of, of uh, radio in this respect is, uh, is Charles Fuller. But, Amy McPherson is also a great exponent of uh, the new media of the 20th century. Um, in this way, they, they anticipate Billy Graham again. And all, all of these figures were writers. So they used the, the written word as well as the spoken word in the prosecution of their ministries. All these elements come together in Billy Graham, don't they? So there's actually quite a lot in this story which uh, functions as the um, as, as the roots or the sources of, of Billy Graham's style of ministry. Dr. Trelore, thank you so much for this extremely enlightening uh, uh, survey of 1900 to 1940 and the development of evangelicalism in the global context. I'm extremely grateful for your reflections.
If I may close with a question that I've been asking all of our interviewees, and that is this, what would it mean for the church to be united? How would we recognize this unity? And what is it that we can do as individual Christians today to pursue the unity uh, for which Jesus prayed in John 17? Mm. You're asking me to be somewhat prophetic, and uh, that's not a gift I claim to, to have in any great measure, but it's a, it's a good question to ask in the context of the history of evangelicalism, because you know, unity in diversity, cooperation despite difference, has been a tension in the movement from the very beginning. Um, the argument between Wesley and Whitfield back in the early days is kind of a paradigm for, for the history of the movement. And what Wesley and Whitfield managed to do was to put aside their, their differences on the question of soteriology, so how people are saved, in order to preach for salvation. So uh, working together to accomplish an end in which they both believed uh, trumped the argument over how salvation is actually uh, promoted. Um, so evangelicals, on the whole, have managed to uh, work with the tension which is inherent in the movement. Um, you know, they have a higher end. Uh, ecclesiology is not a, an aspect of evangelicalism which is often discussed, but it is a fact that evangelicals have a minimalist ecclesiology which enables them to work together despite differences that they might have on important questions. And what is really interesting in uh, the early 20th century is that the wider church takes over this evangelical ecclesiology and makes it the basis of the ecumenical movement. So evangelicals actually provide the church at large with a model which enables them to establish uh, an essential unity which is identifiable because you are confronted with the almost the spectacle of Christians actually working together in pursuit of common ends. So, you know, the early 20th century is actually a good period to be looking at if you're interested in these kind of questions. Now, evangelicals are quite capable of tearing one another apart as well, but at their best, um, people who can sort of hold the, the two elements uh, in a creative kind of tension are able to achieve a unity which um, is, is both observable and has impact in the wider society. Now, how does this work? Well, I guess you know, it varies from context to, to context. American society is very different from Australian society in that you, know, you had your revolution in the 18th century. Um, so to that extent, America has been post-colonial since the late 18th century. Um, the Australian colonies have been self-governing since the 1850s, but really the history of post-colonial Australia doesn't begin to, till 1970. And, and the reason for focusing on this is that I think it has a big uh, effect on the way traditional denominations function and are understood. You know, Methodism, Presbyterianism, um, Episcopalianism, sort of the the denominations imported from Europe in America have had uh, long enough to develop their own identities. And so they continue to function today. And as far as I know, no one seriously questions their, their right to exist. In Australia, it's, it's quite different. Um, the, the traditional denominations are all British imports. And as the society moves away from its British origins, the reason for these denominations um, are very hard to understand. And as a result, the denominations are losing support. But what we see arising in their place are community churches. Now, at one level, they're very local, um, you know, sort of an atomistic kind of approach to church life. But all of these local communities, when the big issues arise, seem to be able to find ways to come together to express a Christian perspective, which then gets fed into the, 
the wider cultural debate or the cultural wars, if you will. Um, so to me, it seems that's, that's the way of the future. Uh, churches will become smaller, more atomized, but on the, the questions which affect their, their operation, their place, their legitimacy in society, society, they will find the ways to come together. And of course, through media like Zoom and Skype, this can be done internationally as well. So I think, um, whilst I can't really forecast how this is actually going to happen, I can see new patterns of church unity uh, emerging. One encouraging feature of the second half of the 20th century, if I might say, um, is that the anti-Catholicism of the first half of the 20th century seems to have waned quite significantly, almost to a, certainly in this part of the world, it's not really a factor anymore. Sectarianism has died right down. So that's a development which must surely um, <clears throat> facilitate the development of, of Christian unity. Mm. Catholics and Protestants can stand on the same platform now with no questions being asked. Yeah, that's, that's a good that's a helpful development, I would say. Yeah. It's been our huge pleasure today to be speaking with Dr. Jeffrey Trelor. Dr. Trelor is Director of Learning and Teaching at the Australian College of Theology in Sydney. Dr. Trelor, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure.